Hi guys, how's it going? I'm Mariana and today I'll read from a book titled Living with Palladio in the 16th Century by Antonio Foscari, published by Lars Müller. Foscari is an architect, professor of architectural history at UAB in Venice and has published extensively on Italian Renaissance architecture. Visiting the villas built by Andrea Palladio, one inevitably asks oneself uh, how people lived there in the 16th century. Palladio articulated the villas as small towns that form a unit with adjacent service buildings and farm fields. Within their walls lived a multitude of people of all ages, social backgrounds and various skills. All the private buildings that Palladio designed for Venetian nobles and uh, gentlemen living in the mainland are referred to as houses in his writings. He took for granted the fact that in his day, a family of high social standing formed a group of people who, as well as being bound by family ties, engaged in a specific trading activity or enterprise, and therefore comprised a unit that carried out an economic function of the kind undertaken by joint stock companies today. Palladio gave his own interpretation of a particular political and cultural trend that saw greater emphasis given in society to the landowner, namely to a gentleman who lived off his private assets and estates. A 16th century seigneurial house would have contained quite a large community, and a varied one, not only in relation to the tasks, uh, responsibilities and roles each individual member undertook, but also in terms of their age, sex and social background. Therefore, these houses were occupied with a level of intimacy that for us today can only be found if we step aside from the bourgeois canons introduced by the French Revolution. Moreover, this intimacy was only tolerated where the house was dominated in theory as well as in practice by the figure of the master, whom Palladio placed at the head of the basic social structure he calls the familia or household. In keeping with this interpretation, the houses built by Palladio were generally conceived as having only one floor. In other words, a single beautiful and decorated story which was for the owner to live in. That an external staircase was the only means of direct access to these apartments is not in itself surprising in the context of Venetian culture, given that in earlier times the piani nobili of Venetian patrician houses were almost exclusively accessed by two flights of steps built within the high walls that enclosed the central courtyard. Instead, in the Casa di Villa designed and built by Palladio, the stairs are positioned on a symmetrical axis to the house and are unprotected by other structures. As such, they form a conceptual but also a physical link between the interior of the house and its surroundings. It is a link which Palladio emphasizes whenever possible by building a road uh, which projects uh, the axis of symmetry through the house and into the landscape, and placing a loggia, a pronaos and a portico at the point where the axes intersect the house, thereby bringing the exterior and interior spaces of the house together. As such, it is, or it wants to be, a sort of marker of acceptance, a celebration of that Pax Veneziana that the Republic had successfully brought about on the mainland after what had seemed like an unending period of war and turbulence. Unprotected and indefensible, this also applies to the house built by Balladio on the Brenta. But it diverges from the scheme used in all the other case di villa he designed. Here, the house rises above a high basement and the portico, which stands above the basement uh, almost like an acropolis, is not accessed by means of a staircase on axis with the symmetry of the building. This decision introduces a degree of detachment between the house and its surroundings. The striking architectonic quality of the external stairs leading to the master's room are countered in Palladio's buildings by the restricted scale of the internal stairs, which the architect defines as smaller, owing to the minimal measurements he gives them. Such a striking difference between the external steps and these internal staircases depends on the subaltern role that Palladio gives to the two floors of the house, which, not by chance, uh, he defines in negative compared with the main floor. The floor underneath and the one at the top are not occupied by gentlemen. 
It is on this basis that Palladio does not give any particular name to either of these two floors, nor does he specifically define their function, and instead he only talks about the rooms at the bottom and the rooms above, sometimes referring to them simply as the places below and above. Let us walk in our imagination into the basement of the house. It contains all the functions linked to domestic management, which Palladio groups under the heading of essentials. The cellars, the wood stores, the pantries, the kitchens, the smaller dining rooms, the laundries, the ovens. The Stanze di Sotto in the house built on the Brenta respect the principle that the essentials, namely the less attractive functions of the house, must be concealed as far from our eyes as possible. To achieve this, the window sills of the rooms at the bottom are positioned quite high up compared with the level of the floor, so that anyone walking or standing outside the house cannot see what is happening inside these basement areas. On the other hand, the fact that Palladio says nothing about a choice that to us may now appear rather surprising namely that of having a granary above uh, the owner's rooms, can be explained uh, because to him it would have seemed quite obvious. For Venetian gentlemen, keeping woods on the ground floor not far above the water level of the lagoon would have been impractical. The granary, the place where agricultural produce was accumulated, is an expression of the raison d'etre of a house that was managed in keeping with the policies of the Republic. Moreover, no other part of the house was more suitable than the places above for storing grains, beans and other vegetables that were harvested throughout the farming year. Not only were they well clear of the dampness of the earth, but they could also be more easily protected from thieves given that there was only one way to get up to the attic, namely up the small staircase whose limited dimensions precluded any rapid escape. The main floor of uh, the villa on the Brenta is divided into two apartments. Palladio does not hesitate to repeat whenever he gets the chance that his buildings have two patrons, not one. Particularly the one erected at Malcontenta, where the patrons are two brothers with joint business interests. Each apartamento usually consists of three main rooms. Palladio was convinced that a layout of this kind was both fitting and sufficient for the needs of a gentleman. Each apartment contains a large, medium-sized and small room, one side by side with the next, so that they can be mutually useful. In the same way as the reduced dimensions of the doors confirm the separation between each apartment and the central hall, which is the architectural fulcrum of the house, so the minimal width of the doors leading between the rooms in each apartment confirms that each room not only has its own autonomous spatial identity, but also a specific function. In these three rooms, as Palladio points out, laying particular emphasis on each word, one sleeps, eats or receives guests. The room where one sleeps in the apartment is clearly the larger one, which Palladio describes as large and spacious. There is space for a bed without making the room feel cramped, since it needs to be used for different purposes at different times of the day. A large Roman fireplace without a projecting canopy stands between the two north-facing windows whose radiant heat will warm the bed facing it. The bed can also rely on the warmth of the wall behind it, since the fireplace in the adjacent square room is on the other side. Between the large room and the small room is a medium-sized room with a square plan. As well as welcoming his relatives, this is where the gentleman would receive strangers, who might also be invited to spend the night. It is worth noting that the stranger, Forestiero, referred to by Palladio, was not just anyone. He was a learned man, probably of high social standing, who happened to be passing by, and as custom dictated, he would have paid a visit after presenting a letter of introduction from a common acquaintance. Finally, the small room is where the gentleman eats. In a patrician house of the Cinquecento, whenever there was not a banquet which would have been held in the portico or central hall of the house, the meals were eaten by the owner almost always alone, 
or more rarely, as far as we know, with his spouse. These meals were never eaten with the children, especially if they were adolescents. But where could the gentleman attend in tranquility to the study of literature and quiet contemplation? Palladio suggests that the place where the owner could undertake intellectual pursuit is the study, Camerino, which he creates above each small room on the main floor by reducing the ceiling height. Palladio himself writes that the small rooms should be divided up to create even smaller rooms where studies or libraries could be located. Apart from the bed in the large room and a simple table supported by wooden trestles in the small room, there were very, very few objects in the apartment. The emptiness created by the absence of furnishings and objects is dictated by social custom in the mid-16th century. But it is a custom that Palladio skillfully interpreted to exalt the conceptual quality of his architecture. In the absence of furnishings, what brought these spaces to life were the figures painted using an impoverished technique that the new generation of artists knew how to practice with speed and modern sprezzatura. Regarding the house built on the Brenta, Palladio says nothing about the function or the possible ways of using the surprising room, which is also the symbolic center of this house. He simply notes that this was where those waiting to greet the master of the house or to ask him for help or a favor can spend their time pleasantly. Even if Palladio is completely silent on this point, we can be certain that banquets and dinners were held here. Although the number of guests invited to Casa di Villa was lower than could be invited to a house in Venice, we should not conclude that a banquet resembled a modern-day dinner party, however sumptuous. It was an event that involved a large number of people, whether guests, ballets, musicians or servants, and there would also have been acquaintances present as spectators standing around the table. This was, in every sense, a spectacle in which everyone, or almost everyone, was both actor and audience. Ask for the book at your local bookstore. Thank you very much for watching this video and uh, see you in the next one. Bye.